Okay. We'll just get started once uh, Eric's set up with the screen. Looks like uh, they're running behind. Here we go. Yes, yep. yep. Just start it. Just click on it and then we'll go. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, you can maximize it. That's great. Cool. Oh, just make sure you sanitize this because I myself and Omar did. Touch yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, that's fine. Okay, so we're going to start with a quiz. So if you want to get your periodic table out, you can. You'll notice that uh, some of the numbers on here, they're not exact. I, I'm so, I left one on there. Okay, never mind that. <laughs> you can skip. Uh, I'll, I'll show it up on the screen in just a second, and you can skip that one. I think I forgot to remove it from the from the from this particular one. Okay. I remember this is only formative, so we'll take it up right after you do it, and we'll just self-assess. And then we're going to use this feedback of just how well did you get all of the complete your systems straight to the name. There's no organic on here. It's only that by uh, binary compounds for molecules uh, and so on. And the, we'll treat the organic as being a P. Well, technically, I should probably do that with the regular grade pen, just so they know that there's not just ionic compounds and the very simple binary uh, other compounds. And I'll put it up on the screen in just a second. I'm going to crack here. And then you have a chance. Okay, so using your periodic table, you're welcome to do so. You're going to be doing these. If you're at home, you don't even have to print this off. You can just have this up on the screen, and you can use those. And you can just do them in your own piece of paper or whatnot. Okay. We'll take us probably about 10 minutes, and then we'll just self-check it together. Is there anyone on your desk? It is the day after yesterday. Oh, I didn't give you one? I must have walked right by you. Um, for number six in the top part, I guess, which you're writing the name, uh, skip it because we haven't covered that. We'll probably go through it today, but I think that's more of an AP thing. Although technically I would do that with, maybe I would do it with my regular tense, but I forgot, <laughs> I forgot I hadn't covered it at the time. So you can skip this one up here, number six. You can skip that one there, okay, because you'll see it and you'll be like, I don't know what that is. And we'll just briefly talk about that today. Yo, uh, probably. You have to come up here and just uh, get it from me. You got it. Oh my gosh! How do people? You can uh, use your phones if you want to, as long as you don't uh, try to cheat. Your phones. Does anyone else need a periodic table?
if you have a hole punch through any of yours, just look up on the screen and they should be there without a hole punch. I think mine got the last one, number 11 on the, on the, on the formula rating. I forgot to give you a quiz.
If you're done, you can just hold tight for a few more minutes as most of us get finished. Which one are you looking at? Uh, number five here? Yeah, sodium perphosphate, yes. Oh, jeez. Let me see this time. Yeah. I'm getting one everybody. Oh, I just posted it today just because I'm not sure exactly what we were going to do. I'm going to bring around a couple other things as well. While we're just waiting for everybody else to kind of finish up uh, before we take it up together. Posted it, I'm not sure.
Okay, when I'm done handing out the next one, then we'll just take other questions. Okay, go for it. Okay, if you are finished the quiz, you could look at uh, this sheet here, the ionic and covalent uh, molecules, or sorry, compounds versus those. You could just kind of do that. It's kind of an independent thing for the most part while you're just waiting for the last couple of people to finish the quiz. You don't really need any self-explanation for this. Otherwise, we'll go through it together, but really just kind of following the instructions they give you and then completing the table at the bottom and that's it. So if you are looking for something to do while you wait, that would be something to do. How many people are technically still writing other than Murday, who is a little bit, a uh, couple minutes behind us? Okay. You're just gonna self-check yourself. So what you should have is something that you could record whether you did something correctly or incorrectly. Just a different color is always good because then it just doesn't blend in so much with your work. Okay. If you see anything on there that I made a mistake on, let me know. This is also a good time to ask for clarification if there was something that you weren't sure of or why did I do something here and so on. I know it says, so we just count these up as five and then five. So there's 10 here and then there'll be 10 on the second one. So you can change your total at the top as well to reflect that it's going to be 20 and now 22. I yeah, remember we weren't doing this one, although we could just do it later today, but now we'll leave it. This is supposed to be a Y. I self fight. Number 10 is bro, uh, hydrobromic acid. Okay, I'll show the other 10 as well. And let me know if I made any mistakes. I guess technically I should have what? AQ next to this one. Uh, then this should be an AQ after that one. Yeah, you're just doing it yourself. Yes. Don't worry about it for now. Don't worry about it. Yeah, if you don't put the AQ in, don't really worry about it at this point. 
because they'd already tell you that it was an asset for the most part in base and so on. Just something to keep in mind that they don't really behave like those until they're dissolved in water. So that's another 10 marks. So after you've done them all, you can just add them all up and give yourself a total at the top. And let me know if I made any mistakes. Now I will say that most people, they asked me about this one up here when we get to that, but we'll talk about that one after. So like our other quizzes, this quiz is for feedback to let you know uh, how much you've been picking up and so on. So I guess if you got less than 16, that be, might be a little bit worrisome. Usually it's a consistent mistake throughout. Um, things to keep in mind is, did I use Roman numerals for multivalence? Did I know it was a multivalent? And so on. Um, anything that is in those transition metals tends to be a multivalent, not always, but for the most part, they do. So anytime you grab a copper, an iron, a lead, those are all going to be multivalents. So the bigger the metals and so on. Okay, um, That's primarily where people go wrong is that. And then it could be something like you use chlorate instead of chlorite and so on. But that's a little blunder that uh, you'll just have to get used to for the most part. Most people run into the issues with the Roman numerals. Okay, and remember, it's only for multivalence. If it's not multivalent like barium, then you don't have to uh, write any Roman numerals and so on. And since there's so many rules and you kind of do them in a short time span, some people kind of get them jumbled up and then they lose their focus and can't remember exactly what to do for each one. Okay. But ideally, you're getting about 16, you know, 15 on there is fine. Uh, hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid. Uh, is he asking about number nine? Number nine? Let's see. Number nine. All right, any questions before we go over SO2? Okay, so for the SO2, people sometimes they want to write sulfite. Did anybody happen to write sulfite? Oh, if you didn't, that's great. Now, most people or some people do get confused by this because this looks a lot like their polyatomic sulfite. However, the difference for SO or I guess hyposulfite SO2 uh, is that it's going to have a charge on it. Okay, this is an uncharged compound, so I know that this going its formula is completely balanced, if you will. There is no charges on it, so you just name this as your regular diatomic molecule. And if you did that, that's great. You're already ahead of the curve, and compared to some other kids I've taught in the course. Okay, so that's perfect. All right, so have that uh, aside there for the most part, and then you're good to go. You can just uh, store that away. Yeah. What about it? I'm not worried about it. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. This is an uh, imperfect solution to a problem that we're going through. So <laughs> we'll deal with it what we can. Okay, now the thing that we're going to go on after this, which is our polar molecules. Oh, yes. Go for it. Um, I'll just record when you left, and that's it. You have to go to the water refilling station. Do you know where that is? 
Okay, if you go down the main hall stairs towards the gym, then when you get to the back of that hall or as you're approaching the gym, you're going to make a right. And you're going to see a water fountain there, and that's where the filling station is. Nowhere else. Yeah. Yeah. It's outside of the cafeteria at the back. All right, I'll just record that. Eric, Eric, and Eric, this is 856. Okay, I think on Friday we talked about polar bonds and sharing and stuff like that. Okay, you might have got that online and whatnot. Okay, so we're gonna continue. We're gonna continue that talking about partial charges. Now, this is AP. This will not be on our chemistry test when we get to that point. This is just a heads up for when you get, or sorry, when you take AP chemistry. If you don't take AP chemistry, you'll get this in grade 11 chemistry uh, again, okay? Now, what we're going to establish here is there is a difference between having a polar, uh, a polar bond and having a polar molecule. There's a slight bit of difference there. A polar bond or multiple polar bonds doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a polar molecule at the end. And we're going to look at this on a very basic perspective. There is complexity here, but we're just going to look at this in a very, a very simple way. We're not going to go into a great detail. That will be something that they expand on. But we'll just give you the basic idea of what a polar molecule is by comparison to something that's not polar. Uh, and then you already know what an ion is. Okay. All right, so the main difference between what we covered on Friday is we're going to be exploring what a specific the polar molecule is outside of just a polar bond. And what was the polar bond electronegativity difference from Friday? What were the values that would make it polar? They were between two numbers. Yeah, it was 0. 0.5 and then 1 point. Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, 1.7. Or sorry, yeah, 1.7, okay? So those are our polar molecules, and we're kind of review or polar bonds, and we'll review that today. Now, polar bonds and molecules do not always guarantee that you end up with a molecule that we consider polar, okay, as part, uh, and so on, okay? There are two things to consider when determining whether a molecule is polar or not. So the first thing is what we covered the other day. Does it have a polar bond, okay? And we already know how to determine that because you look at the electronegativity difference, right? So you do that, you, you look at your electronegativity difference, and that's kind of what we did on Friday, okay? And anything between 0 0.5 to 1.7, that's a polar bond. Okay. Now, if you remember, what was it about the polar bond that, uh, what was unique about it and how would these particles that were in the bond behaved or characteristics that they have. So if you had something like water, and we'll look at water again. All right, I know that one of these is more electronegative. I know that this one's more electronegative and this one's not. Uh, uh, Angela? The partial charges, okay. So the thing that was more attractive in the bond, we'll get the negative charge. I just can't really blow on that because I have my mask on. And the other thing that was not so, ah, a smudged, not so attractive, got a plus charge. Okay, and then you would look at each bond individually. Okay, so if you look at water, for instance, you would do the EN difference for this bond here. And you would establish that there's a difference in those two things. And then you would also have to look at this bond as well. They turn out to be the same bond, so that's okay. And then you will know that this one also gets a partial charge as well. All right, and then we talked about those charges. And then these charges have the ability to attract other things. And we briefly talked about that when we talked about plants and transpiration. This was the charges that allowed water molecules to adhere to one another or cohere and then adhere to the surfaces uh, along these inside of the xylem. Okay, it's because of these charges. We also had you a symbol to represent what was having more draw on those electrons. We oh, we use this kind of arrow thing like that. You could technically have two of those and so on and so forth. Okay, So that's where we were on Friday. We just tried to establish that not all sharing of electrons is equal. 
Some things can pull those electrons much more than other things when they share. Okay? So this is the unequal sharing that we looked at on, on Friday. Okay? Now, the second thing, and this is new today, is how the bonds are oriented around the central atom. I'm just going to highlight that here because that's the second piece. Now, a lot of this, you're not going to be able to do a lot of this, but it's just a, really a heads up for when you move forward. Okay? <laughs> we haven't um, really addressed um, positioning of things around. Now, I've drawn water to be like this, and there's a reason why I've drawn water like this, but that's something you do generally in grade 12. You might do that in grade 11 AP chemistry, but there's a reason why water is drawn like this and you don't draw it like this. And there's a reason for that. Okay. All right. So when you have to do this part, you have to look at the orientation of the bonds. And this is how I drew that orientation here. And you'll see a couple other orientations down here as well. Okay. All right. So you're going to examine the structural diagram. Remember, anytime you have these uh, lines with your symbols and you're showing where the things, how and why they're connected, you're showing their structural diagram. Okay. And you're going to see if the bonds are evenly or symmetrically oriented around. Okay. Um, and we're only going to touch on this because we don't spend a lot of time talking about the shapes that atom or molecules uh, take. We'll briefly talk about it here, and then we'll just give you a basic overview of how you determine the polarity of a molecule. Okay, so you're looking at how they if they're evenly spaced or if the molecule is symmetrical around the central atom. Okay, so you have to look at around the some central atom. Okay. All right, so for example, we're going to use uh, boron trifluoride. We're going to determine if it's polar or nonpolar, and then we're going to um, based on the diagram. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do number one is we're going to look for a difference in electronegativity. So we're going to take fluorine, boron. We're going to write in our values, and we're going to see if there's a polar bond. All right, so we're going to go to a periodic table. We're going to look at the electronegativity of fluorine, which is 3.98. We're then going to go to boron, which is 2.04. We're going to take the difference between those two things. And we get what, 0 0.94? Or 1.9? 1 1.94? 1.44? Oh, geez. Okay. We broke, <laughs> we broke my rule. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's. <laughs> this is over 1.7. Okay. <laughs> so let's just, uh, let's just ignore what I just said previously about the uh, 1.7. It <laughs> is a sharing uh, of the things. But anyway, let's just simply say that, yes, it is going to be a polar bond, okay? So that means that every BF bond here is going to be polar. Now, based on these electronegativities, which one of these two things is the more of a pull, the fluorine or the boron? The fluorine. So this would get your partial negative charge, and this would get your partial positive charge. Okay? And that would be the same thing. They're, all these bonds are the same here. But these all pull more than the boron. <laughs> okay. All right. Now the reason the reason that there is an issue with boron here is because it's a it's a it's one of the metalloids and it doesn't really it's 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 hard to pinpoint exactly where it's going to be as far as the difference is. And even though it is a higher number, it's not fully ionic and so on. So boron is yeah, so there you go. It's technically, it probably should be an ionic thing, but because it's metalloid, it's more, more like a non-metal now. So it's even though I guess the value is fairly large, it's still going to end up sharing. It just it's a very loose sharing, I'd imagine. Okay. Anyway, so yes. Yes. Um, atoms are arranged symmetrically around four. Yes. Atoms. Doesn't that make it non-polar? We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. All right. 
So we are going to now look at the shape. So this shape is how the atoms associate. Now, this is how chemists and scientists have determined this. This is how they position themselves, these atoms, around the other atoms. Okay. Now, there is a name for this structure. It actually tends to be flat as well. So this is the, like a top-down view. If you looked at it from the side, it would just be kind of like a flat. It's, it's planar. So I think they usually call this planar, but don't worry about it. It's something you'll cover in grade 12 or maybe 11 AP. But if you looked at it from top down, just our top down perspective, let's just use that as our guiding principle here. Now, does this look symmetrical, so to speak? Or does this look like it has evenly spaced bonds? It does look evenly spaced. Okay, now, there are things that you'll learn about in the future when you look at molecules, especially organic molecules. This one is not organic, but it's going to have some of the overlap with those. Is you're going to look at the shape of them and bond angles. The angle of bond between here and here is the same as here and here, which is the same as here and here. Like in math, you use what? That this is the same as this, the same as this, as far as like angles go or whatnot. Right? Although if it was different, you'd have a second marking in there and whatnot. So these angles are all the same. So they are evenly spaced, these fluorines, around the boron. The boron. Right? So they are evenly spaced around the central atom. I guess I should have highlighted that around the central atom as well, because that's the main thing. Okay? Okay. So they're evenly spaced. So even though there are polar bonds in here, I do now have evenly spaced bonds. And if they're evenly spaced, that will make something, they kind of cancel each other out. And this would become a polar or a nonpolar molecule. Okay. I think I stated at the bottom there. Okay. So if the bonds are symmetrically oriented or evenly spaced, you have a nonpolar, a nonpolar molecule. All right, now we're going to use that same guiding principle for this molecule here. We've already kind of looked at this previously. We compared our EN differences on Friday between oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, oxygen was 3.44 and hydrogen was 2.2. There we go. That's a little bit nicer for me. You get 1.24 as your difference, which is classically polar. All right, this one is more electronegative. This one is not as electronegative. And then you get the same type of bond over here. It's the same thing we drew up at the top there. Now, so now I'm going to decide, is it symmetrical or are they evenly placed? And it has to conform to both of those, I'd imagine to some degree. So I guess you could be symmetrical like so, but you're not symmetrical this way and so on. But let's use our evenly spaced rule here. So the bonds between from, from this one to this one all the way around, is that the same as this bond here? So if I compare this bond, whee, or this angle, is it the same as this one here? No. So this one is different than that one. And so I know that they're not the same. So does that mean that they're evenly spaced? No. Okay. So these are not evenly spaced. And there is polar bonds. So what would I consider this thing? Polar molecule. Okay. Now it... When you go on in chemistry, you'll learn about different shapes and bond angles. You need to know these values and so on. But for now, we're not going to go into that detail. All you have to know is that in order to be a polar molecule, which will make the molecule different than nonpolar ones, is that you need polar bonds and you need a specific orientation of those atoms around each other to see if it's symmetrical or not. Um, so if I had another hydrogen here, it would be evenly spaced and you would be a uh, nonpolar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, the significance and the reason that we talked about this is that, uh, so the reason you want to determine this is that because polar and nonpolar is because both types of molecules behave differently. So if you're going to do something with molecules, you have to know how they behave. So that is the properties of polar molecules are different than the properties of nonpolar molecules. And this has a big, this is big in biology as well, as well as organic chemistry and other types of chemistry. So the type of bonds and molecules will affect the properties on how it behaves. And we're going to look at that a little briefly in just a minute. But for now, we'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. So just try yourself out and see if you can determine, just based on our rules, whether or not these four molecules, one, two, three, if these five molecules are polar or not polar. And then we'll just kind of go through that together. Yeah, sure.
I just wrote the differences of or the numbers up there just to make your life a little bit easier, and then you decide on whether or not it's going to be polar or not. Yeah, stretching, Eric. Stretching. Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to do it anyway here, so you'll be all up to snuff. Okay. So, okay. So we're taking the difference between each of the bonds and the molecules. So these are all CO bonds. So I just do this once, and I find the difference. That's what we did on Friday. Okay. So then we decide: is this a polar bond or not a polar bond? So the difference between a C and an O in the electronegativity of these of 0.89 is a polar or nonpolar? Polar. Okay, because we said 0 0.5 and 1.7. Okay, so the polar bond. Okay. Then I decide, is it symmetrical and or is it evenly spaced between um, the areas that are polar? Okay, so you have a 
partial negative, partial negative, partial positive. So if you look at this, is it evenly spaced or symmetrical? symmetrical? Yeah, and evenly spaced, right? So then, therefore, even though there's polar bonds, it's evenly spaced or symmetrical. So is it polar or nonpolar? It's not polar. It'll get different down here. It's going to get slightly different down here. Okay. All right. Let's look at this one here. The difference between the F of the O is 0 0.52. So it's slightly polar, not super polar, but it's slightly polar. And then looking at the shape here. So we do have a slightly polar bond, not crazy polar. It's only slightly. And then to look at this one here, uh, the shape, is this evenly spaced and or symmetrical? No. So then what do I side on this molecule here? Uh, Jim? It's polar. Okay. Then we do the same thing down here. These are all polar bonds. They're all the same, right? Each of these bonds are the same. Okay, so there's polar molecule or bonds here. Polar bonds here. However, even though they're polar bonds, it's symmetrical and or evenly spaced. A little bit of both, right? They're all 90 degree angles from one another and they're evenly spaced. Okay, so this is a nonpolar. Okay. All right, so this one's a little bit different because there's two types of bonds here. Now, if you do delve any deeper into um, polarity, 0.5, even 0.5 is a little bit higher to become polar. Even 0.49, as you're approaching that 0.5, is still considered polar. I think some chemists will tell you 0.4 is your cutoff. I usually use 0.5, but 0.4 can also be the cutoff. Is it? Remember, it is a transitional thing. So the more you go away from zero, the more polar it's becoming. So as you get 0.49, it's now approaching a polar, more associated with polar, polar bonds, and so on. So we're going to treat this one as a polar bond because it's approaching our 0.5, okay? So this one here would be a partial negative, partial positive. These ones are not as polar, right? So these ones are going to try, they're doing, me, essentially there's gonna be no charge on those ones, okay? Or very, by comparison to this one, okay? So you have a charge over here that has a charge, but there's no charge over here. So if I'm only looking at this molecule, is it polar or nonpolar? So this is evenly spaced. However, this is a different type of thing over here than over there. And this one has a charge on it. This one doesn't. So would you say that this is symmetrical and or evenly spaced? No. Okay. It's not symmetrical, right? Because this is a charge on it. This one doesn't have a charge on it. And therefore, it's polar. It does get kind of complicated. And again, we're just going to look at this in passing for the most part. As long as you kind of know how to do this, you're okay. And I'm not going to test you on it or anything. Looking at this one here as well, it's kind of the same sort of thing. You're polar, slightly polar here, not polar. So these are your regions of polarity here, right? So this is your polar bonds, okay? And the other ones are not polar. And then you decide, is it symmetrical and or evenly spaced? Are the polarities displaced symmetrically? Are they evenly spaced? Amongst the whole thing? No. Okay. So this is going to be polar as well. Okay. Now, if it was chlorines everywhere, this would be evenly spaced and symmetrical. So it would be nonpolar. But they're not, and so on. Now, we're only going to do that in passing for the most part anyway. Okay. All right, the last little thing that we're going to do in our just in passing is we're briefly going to talk about one last thing, which is hydrates, which is a really easy thing to do as far as nomenclature goes. But you might come across these as you move into AP chemistry. So I'm briefly going to talk about those here. Where did I put my hydrates? Hydrates are in here somewhere. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
we're briefly going to talk about this, and then we'll go into our uh, our properties. So we didn't cover this. I don't know if do I do this with my grade tens? I don't know if I normally do. It's a small thing anyway. Now you wouldn't have dealt with a lot of this stuff as a, as a student, but as a teacher, I see this more often uh, than not. Where I'll I'll be trying to make a solution for a lab, and then I need a certain type of uh, compound that I'm going to be using, and sometimes I get those comp compounds in the form of what is known as a hydrate. And there's nothing exceptionally different or difficult about these. They all behave exactly the same way as a non-hydrated form of this uh, compound, except these ones are hydrates versus the others, which would be considered anhydrides. Um, so we're just going to briefly talk about what a hydrate is, although it, doesn't, it won't really apply to you guys all that much. It's just a heads up for when you go into AP, uh, great, uh, uh, AP chemistry. You might be dealing with some uh, hydrates when you get there. But definitely do this in regular chemistry in grade 11. Okay, so a hydrate is an anion compound. So just like all our other ones, polyatomic, multivalent, binary, whatever. But they have a specific number of water molecules in their chemical formula. So if you look down below here, here's an actual um, hydrate formula. Now you could name this part, right? If you had to name this part here, what would you name it? That's it, right? And then the hydrate part is super easy. You just then talk about how many waters are attached to it. Okay, and that's it. So when the reason we have them is because when they crystallize, and we talked about the crystal lattices that ionic compounds form. So they form this solid. And as they form that solid and lattice, they can trap water molecules with them as part of their compound. And they actually do it in a kind of a, uh, in a, in a predictable way. They always form, this, form the same hydrate. It's just when they form, there's an association with water that also gets captured in the lattice. In their, solid, in their solid form, the water is part of their structure in the compound. So if you really were to look at it over here, there are waters that are attached into here. So the waters are depicted by these things here. So there's going to be, there's one here, there's one here, here, here. Now some of them they're showing bonded to kind of the thing that's in there. You see that they're all over, right? So there's your water, uh, waters, and so on. Okay, so they're showing that water is a part of the crystal lattice. So they're supposed to be indicating on this diagram that there are the elements, the ions that are trapped in this crystalline structure, but there's also waters trapped in here as well. Okay. Now you're not going to be able to predict how many waters are going to be trapped with it. Okay, that's something you do in grade 11. Okay. You just have to know that if you see the hydrate, how, what the name means, and then how to draw the formula for it, and that's it. And there's no real rules here that are any different other than the fact that you just simply describe how many waters are trapped with it. Okay. So when you're naming them, you name the ionic part just as if you did it by your normal rules. So for instance, if you see this structure here, you're going to name this part here first. And as Marde already said, it's barium hydroxide. Barium hydroxide. That's it. And then you look at the uh, prefix, if there is one, uh, sorry, then you add a prefix to indicate uh, uh, and attach to the word uh, hydrate to indicate that there's water there. And the prefix is how many waters. So if I saw eight H2Os, which means eight water molecules are part of, uh, every time you see this, there's going to be eight water molecules associated with it. So what part of that name would I have? So I'm going to use hydrate for the water. And then what am I going to use to represent the eight? Yeah, octa. So it'd be octahydrate. And then when you write the full name down, you put it all together, and you would write this whole thing as barium hydroxide octa hydrate. Yep. And that's it. And then the formula is exactly the same thing, but you use the name to then write the formula and that's it. So the first thing you would do here is you write the formula for the ionic part 
which is mercury one nitrate, which you'd use what H G N O three. And then you throw a dot. Did I show that? A dot? I don't think I did that. Okay. So then you read the hydrate portion of the name and then you use H2O to represent the hydrate. And you look for the prefix before hydrate. So usually you do a, like a dot. And then this is dihydrate. And then what does the di mean? Two, right? So di means two, so then you'd have two H2O because the hydrate is the water. And that's the, the water. And then when you put it all together, you end up with HGNO3 uh, dot, and then you do two H2O. It's pretty simplistic. There's no, there's not much different between the ionic stuff and then doing this. Other than you just, if it has hydrate in it, you write down how many waters. If you flip that page over, there's a bunch of just brief hydrate things. I give about five minutes just to go through them. They're all about the same. There's no added complexity to this at all. You can just do a few of them, names and formulas. Yes. Yes. You guys are like washroom people today. You went three weeks without a washroom break, and now everything's in one day. If you get stuck in it, let me know. We can take it up. Otherwise, they're pretty straightforward. There's not anything crazy in here. It's really just adding that little bit there for the hydrates, if you see the formulas. It becomes a big deal in grade 11 because when you do calculations, the hydrate portion has to be taken into consideration. Copper to uh, 
for the car in it. That's right, right? Uh, cobalt two chloride. Excellent. Right, I did the first five there. They're not that tough. And I'll do like five of the formulas ones. So H G N O three two H two O. Uh, S N C L four five H two O P B was it C H two C O O two dot three H two O M G Oh, uh, we didn't do chromate, did we? Don't worry about that. So you can skip this part here and just do that 5H2O. Chromate is what, CRO2, something like that? Don't worry about it. CRO04. CRO04, yeah. And then manganese, uh, MN. Uh, bromide doesn't really indicate what manganese it is. So let's just do MNBR, and then we'll, we'll skip that, and we'll just do the 4 h 2 o fine. Okay. The only tricky thing here is just doing that part there. I'll do this first five. Okay. Any manganese is what, two or four? Yeah, two, three, four, six, seven. So it doesn't indicate, so I'll have to switch that in the future. And this is very complicated there. If you want to know another one, let me know, and I can write it up on the screen. Otherwise, I would trust your judgment. They're not terribly difficult. Or you can ask me about anything on those later if you want to. Uh, we're going to get to this briefly, and then we're going to move into our chemical reactions, and then we'll call it a day. The stuff up here is really just about properties associated with the two different types of compounds we've talked about. We haven't even... So when we deal with the properties of covalent things, so we're talking about the covalents. This would also incorporate nonpolar polar. However, we're not looking at them as a separate entity here. We're just talking about the fact that there could be 
different behaviors within this spectrum of covalence molecules. All right, because there's two types of compounds, molecules uh, uh, that form because of the bonds that they have, they're gonna have different properties. Okay, the bonds and the atoms that participate, participate in these things are gonna bring properties with them associated with it. The bonds that are there are gonna give different properties and so on. Okay. Covalent molecules don't generally have charges. As a result, they are not attracted to other molecules, but they can have charges because we know that because there's polars. Okay. Ionic compounds do have charges and are strongly attracted to other ions. Uh, things with charges. Not that that really matters for us at this point. Okay. All they want you to do now is you're going to look at the different molecules or compounds here, just overall compounds, look at their properties, and you're going to be looking for commonalities in those properties, and then down here you're going to state the overall general property for ionics, the general appearance of ionics, the general appearance of melting point for ionics, and then the same thing for covalence. They haven't told you if anything is ionic or covalent, so you're just going to use in the formula to determine that. Okay. And then after a few minutes, I'll just start to label which one of these are, and then you can just fill in the table there. Okay. And we don't have really good tests for these in class, otherwise we would do a lab for this. I don't want you to, we're not, we can't use heat while we're here, so we can't really check melting point, boiling points, but we'll do what we can otherwise. Okay, So we'll do this in a little bit more dry way. So determine if these things are molecules or ionic and then look at their generalizations and properties and so on okay and i'll give you about let's say five ten minutes maybe for that you won't need any more than that I have added some information up there that you can definitely do the table with now if you haven't already determined that.
Sí. Yeah. Citric acid is with ascorbic acid. I don't know the formula. It would be citrate, I guess, is the. I don't think so. Glucose is on there. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you can have gas iron. You would never encounter it. So you can melt it, but they probably don't have a boiling point. They might, they might, well, I guess they do, but I don't know if there comes off as a gas. Yeah, that's a good, because uh, I guess the only time you'd really see, yeah, I guess if you worked at like a, a metal processing, right, like a furnace where you are, um, melting down the metal, you might potentially get some gas, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know if it, if it comes off as a vapor. Yeah, I know there's a melting point, but I don't know if there is a boiling point where you get a vapor coming off. You'd have to Google it. Yeah. Yeah. See what the boiling, the melt, the boiling point for um, iron is, just pure iron. Yeah. Is there an iron vapor? Because when you boil water, the water vapor comes off of it. But I don't know if there's an iron vapor. Because you would imagine that if it condenses, it would be covering things like condensation of water and so on. But I don't ever think that people get iron vapor on them that condenses. Gaseous iron does exist, but no one uses it or no one really encounters it because a nearly 3,000 degree vapor trying to fill up a room yeah. would probably kill you really quick. Yeah. So no one. Yeah. So they usually bring iron, I guess, to their melting point, but not the boiling point. Yeah. But if anything has a boiling point, it should theoretically be vaporizing at that point. Not all of it, but some of it will come off as a vapor. Also, it says gaseous metals do not retain metallic bonds, conductivity, luster, or any other metallic properties. They're no different from other gases. There you go. That's cool. <laughs> I'm just finishing my table, then you can compare yours to mine after. Okay, I'm going to put my table up there, then you can compare yours to mine. I 
Okay, this is solid, liquid, and gas. That is not all at the same time. It just means there's examples. If you look at this covenant compound and this one, some might be solids, some might be liquids, and some might be gases and so on. For instance, in this room, there are gaseous molecules, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide around you and the gas, but there's no ionic gases that are a compound. There might be ions in the air, but there's no ionic compounds in the air. They all tend to be solids. Now the generalization, so this is really just a general, as all of these things are. In general, they're all white crystals, but they can have color as well. Okay, so some of the hydrates have colors, but when you take the water out of them, they usually go to white. So copper sulfate, if you saw the crystals blue, but if you get the water out, it's white. Same with the copper chloride and so on. Copper chloride can have a kind of a green color, but when you anhydrate to take the water out, it's gonna be white and so on. So they all tend to be white crystalline structures. Whereas these vary, right, in color for sure, clear, white, green, dot, 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 the, the colors go on and so forth. So there's a variation there. Well, there's these tend, not always, but they all tend to be white crystals. These ones tend to have a variety of different colors of things that are covalent, okay? High, low, high, low. Off to work we go, <laughs> if anybody knows the reference, okay? Um, yes, no, but this does vary, okay? But generally, no. Yes, no, generally, but it does vary. Okay, so polar things are probably better at conducting and, and uh, being soluble than nonpolar things, so it varies. But we'll default to no as a, as a, as a difference between the two. Okay. Now these are all, remember, these are just general perspectives. There are exceptions to everything. So there are things that are not water soluble here that are ionic, but generally they all are. So these are just general rules. There are exceptions. But if you ever had to guess about a prop, if you saw something that was a solid and it wasn't dissolving in water, you'd probably think it was an ionic substance. Okay? If you saw something that was a gas, uh, then you would know that it's covalent and so on. So they're good generalizations, but they're not the whole story. Okay? As you learn about more chemistry, you'll learn about the exceptions and so on. All right, so the first part of our chemistry is looking at nomenclature and a little bit between ionic and covalent structures and compounds and so on, including the properties associated with each. Now we'll explore some of this moving forward. I'm gonna start doing some labs with you, although I have to reorient move the classroom a little bit. Those desks have to go over here eventually because that's blocking off some of our counter space that I would like to use. Um, so I'm gonna to try to do safe labs Apparently they can't involve any flames or heat. So we'll do the best that we can. I think primarily because they were saying that a lot of the disinfectant stuff is flammable and so on, and we don't wanna have any sparking up of people's hands and, and so on. And I don't know, okay. Um, it could also create convection currents, I guess where high air rises, cool air falls down and it circulates stuff through the room a little bit easier which is not great if you have a virus that's potentially in the room and so on, okay? So we'll try to do some labs. I'm gonna start doing our next time I see people, which is Friday, okay? And then the lab that you miss because you're not here, we'll try to get you guys doing those on Tuesday. Okay? Ideally, that's what I would like to do, okay? Um, we've gotta do something in chemistry anyway, because that's the whole point of, of learning about chemistry. Now we couldn't do much labs pre previously to this because um, nomenclature doesn't really warrant any labs. You're really learning about formula, writing, bonding, and stuff like that. We're not going to do labs associated with that, but we are going to do labs associated with reactions. And that's where we're going to send our next focus here, which is chemical reactions. Now, you did a little bit of chemical reactions last year when you looked at chemical and physical changes, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Now, even some of the stuff that I do right now, it might be a little bit review from last year. Did you guys do word equations last year? 
vertical. Okay, some of you might have, some of you might have. So we're going we're gonna to quickly go through those. Oh, you didn't buy, okay. Got your photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Okay. All right, so we're going to kind of go into, now chemical reactions are fundamental, I guess, or they're one of those things that everybody kind of associates with chemistry is writing out reactions or understanding reactions because chemistry is really about the transformations of matter from one type of thing to another through a reaction. So we're going to go into how you write a reaction um, and then how you can interpret a reaction and so on. And then we'll add something to this that's going to go into, uh, maybe, I don't know if you talked about it last year, but we'll talk about it this year. Okay. All right, a chemical reaction involves changes in substances. Okay. One or more starting substances, which we will call the reactants. So reactants are the things that you are starting with and are planning on reacting together. That's why they call them reactants. So I'm going to start with these two or three things, and I want them to react. They are my reactants. Are changed into one or more new substances, which we shall call the products. So new things are products. So now when you talk about chemistry reactions, you are going to be using words like reactant and products. And a chemical reaction, the ways in which atoms are joined together are changed. Now, we're not going to go into the specifics here, but they are changed. The reactants collide, uh, the reactant particles will collide, bonds are broken, and the new bonds form. Okay, so new form between what particles are there. Okay. However, the same atoms that are present in the reactants are the ones that are also in the products. There's nothing new there. They're simply rearranged. Okay, so keep that in mind. So whatever you started with, you end up with the same things. They're just rearranged. Okay, so you have the same atoms in the reactants are the ones that are present in the products, okay? So they're just rearranged. There's nothing new. So the key takeaway from that is even though you have new products forming, they're not new substances. There's no new elements in there and stuff like that. Okay. Sorry, I guess they want me. I was supposed to write a reaction down here. Okay, let me write a reaction then. Okay. So let's just take something like a very simplistic, like uh, HCl plus NaOH. All right, and then I'm going to write down uh, um, NaCl plus H2. Oh, let's just do that. Okay. Now I'm going to write down AQ, AQ. All right, and I'm going to write down uh, AQ. Go down my grid. That's supposed to be like a, a cursive L. All right. Now, there's a couple symbols I use in chemical equations. The reactants are written on the left, okay? And this is all relative. These are relative to an arrow. Now, the arrow is what separates the reactants from the products. Okay, so here's my arrow. So anything to the left of that is a reactant. And anything to the right of that are the products. So these are my reactants. These are my products. It's not rocket surgery here. You probably already knew that for the most part. You've probably seen equations like this, knowing that what you start with and what you finish with. Hmm? Now, if I looked at the elements here, so you can see there's hydrogen, chlorine, sodium, oxygen, hydrogen. Is there anything new over here as far as elements go that was not on the left side? Well, oxygen's here, and so is sodium. There's sodium, there's oxygen. Oh, sorry. 
Is there any any different symbols or elements on this side than there was on this side? Uh, Angela? No, there is not. There's not. Yes. Um, sure, but that's not an element. That's simply how we're, how the, what form the compound takes, okay? But there's no new elements. What we started with is what we finished with. There's nothing new here, okay? So that's just the stipulation that we want to make point of is that there's the same atoms here as the same order here, except they're rearranged. Okay. Sodium is no longer with oxygen and hydrogen. It's now with chlorine and so on. Okay. So there's nothing new here. All right. Now, if there is more than one thing on a side, so if there's more than one reactant, we use a plus sign. And that's read as reacts with, or you can say this and that, whatever you want. It can also be an and and so on, okay? So you see a HCl and NaOH react, and they form NaCl and water or H2O, okay? So this means, so if there is more than one, we put a plus between them. If there's more than one over here, we put a plus between them, okay? Now the arrow itself is supposed to indicate that it produces or yields. Or you can even react with whichever. So this was before in time, and this is after in time. This is the arrow transitioning from reactants to products. So these things react and produce these things. Okay. And those are the basic symbols of a reaction that you probably have seen before. And you probably already knew what they were used for, just now we're going to be a little bit more explicit in discussing that. Now, what I wrote here is a true chemical reaction. It's not the version we're gonna finalize with. It's mostly there, it's about 80% of it. But there is other forms of word equations that we're gonna briefly talk about. Now, this might've been something you did last year, which is something which is known as a word equation. Now, a word equation, what it uses is words, so it's gonna be the names of molecules and not the formula. So a word equation identifies reactive products based on the by name, okay? So word equations are all about using the names, but you use the basic symbols are the same. So pluses and arrows and stuff like that. So if you looked at a proper word equation, it would look like something like this because you're using the names and not the actual formula. Okay, so in word equations, there's no formulas. It's, it's a name. You use whatever the name is. Okay. So if you were to read this out, right, it would be iron reacts with oxygen to produce or to yield iron to oxide. You generally don't use those all that much because as a chemist, you want to use formula because it's going to show you how many of each atom is there. And then you have to account for those in the reaction. Okay. All right, so give it a whirl. See if you can come up with a word equation for uh, these two pro uh, examples at the bottom there. And then I'll start writing them in. You can check yours. You're not going to have to do a lot of these. This is just the idea of what the word equation is. It's not rocket surgery.
super long one. Should have wrote a long, shorter one, shouldn't I? All right, nothing crazy there. You just write the names. You put in your pluses and your arrows, and you're good to go. Good to go. All right. Now, we're not going to be doing – oh, yes. Sodium, uh, hydrogen, carbonate is one thing. Right, so sodium, this is what? A, uh, N, A, H, C, O, 3. Okay. That's one thing. Okay. All right. Now, what we're going to spend most of our time doing is writing a chemical equation and not a word equation. And we're going to incorporate a couple different things in here. So in addition to writing the uh, formula... Okay, so chemical equations, you're going to have formula, not names. So you're going to have to write the formula. So this is where the, all the nomenclature really helps us out because you need the nomenclature to know what a name is and then to know what the formula is and so on. So even though we've stopped going over the rules of nomenclature, we're still going to use it because that's how you really communicate in chemistry. And we're also going to indicate states of things as they can be determined. So some you'll come to get to know, some will just be generally known and whatnot, and things that you can't determine, we'll leave it at that. But that's where the properties of our um, ionic and covalent things come in. If it's an ion, it's generally going to either be a solid or it's going to be dissolved in water, which is uh, we're con it's considering aqueous. Okay? So these are the symbols that you'll find typically. There are other symbols in chemical reactions. I think you tend to see like things like this, like a, a triangle, which is like a difference of or a change and so on. It can be temperature, electricity, and stuff like that. But these are the basic ones. So pluses, arrows, S for solids, L for liquids, G for G, uh, gas, and then AQ for dissolved in water, which is aqueous. So for example, you would see zinc solid, Copper sulfate is dissolved in water, dissolved in water, this comes out as a solid, and then plus energy, which is not really, a, has, it's not matter, so you can just write like energy there for the most part, okay? All right, now, a couple things I want to mention about states. If you have a metal by itself, the general rule is that it's always solid. Except for one, which is, does anybody accept for what the exception is? For solid metals. Yeah, mercury. But otherwise, all metals are solid. So if you see them by themselves, you default to solid. Copper by itself, solid. Zinc by itself, solid. Okay. Yes. We're not going to a 3,000 degree furnace. Okay. If you see ionic things in a reaction, they're going to also tend to be dissolved in water as well. So ionic things will generally be aqueous on these as well, dissolved in water. Um, so ionic, in order for them to react, have to be dissolved in water. Okay. So... This basically means I have copper sulfate dissolved in water, and I'm probably going to plop some zinc into that water as well to get it to react. And then that's it. And then these are the products here. These are still dissolved in water, and then you have this as salt. Well. Now, we'll go into more rules for this a little bit later. But for now, these are just general observations for the most part. Okay. All right, if you want to convert this into a chemical equation. So go from the word to a chemical equation.
there's nothing you do for energy, just write energy is fine. Uh, we'll talk about that after. You know, the one thing I'll mention about this here is that when you see energy on the reactant side, like if you're actually, and so what this looks like is I'm taking this and I'm adding energy to it or I have energy with it. So usually this is kind of, if you see it in a word equation, you might see things like is heated, right? Um, you might see there's an electrical current passed through it, but most of the time, Most of the time, it's going to be heat. Okay. Now, I would normally have this as an AQ, but if I'm heating it, I don't want to dissolve. I'm basically just heating it. So it'd be kind of like the idea that you have a, like a Bunsen burner here that has its flame going, right? And you have some sort of container. Let's say, let's just have a watch glass there, and then I have my solid on top of it. And I'm basically just heating it over the flame and seeing if anything changes about it, okay? So if you see something like this, it usually means you just have the solid version of that, you're heating it, and you're seeing if anything changes, and it looks like there is, okay? Now, carbon dioxide is around us, so if it's produced, what state are we gonna predict it to be? Gas. A gas, okay? So if you ever see CO2, just predict it as being a gas. You, I don't think you've, the only time you ever not see it as gas is it's frozen. Like it's cooled down to sub whatever. You've probably seen frozen CO2 before because um, they use that to do like fog and stuff like fog effects and whatnot, frozen ice or what do we call it? Like dry ice, I think they call it. Okay. Now, since I only had this, any remnant of anything, so this I know is a gas, the remnant would be a solid and so on. Okay. But you'll get used to doing stuff like that a little bit later with more practice. Okay. But usually if you see energy as a reactant, it's going to be in the form of heat, usually. And that's going to be some sort of flame. It could be a hot plate. It could be a water bath or something like that and so on. Okay. All right. Now, what you will do mostly in this course is the chemical equation. But we're going to add one more detail to that, and that is a balanced chemical equation. Now, what we're going to spend time talking about is what is balanced or balancing involved. Now, we balance chemical equations because there is a law in chemistry, and that is the law of conservation of mass. And I already stated it for the most part. It was basically whatever you start off with in the reactants, you also end up with in the products. There's nothing new. It's all conserved, except everything is rearranged. Okay. 
So the mass of the products will always equal the mass of the reactants. That is the law, law of the conservation of mass. Now, what I'm going to have us do probably on Friday is do that a lab to show that. I'll make it as simplistic as possible. You'll know exactly what to do, but I'm going to have you to observe it as best that we can, okay, to put it to the test. Atoms are not created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Now, it is possible that if you do have reaction occurring, because you do have an atmosphere, it's possible that something in the atmosphere does go into your equation, but then you'd have to account for that in your reactants as well. Okay, so sometimes we use the oxygen in the room as one of our reactants. Okay, but that would be represented in the equation. So they're not created or destroyed in a chemical re reaction. They all simply get rearranged. Okay? To balance a chemical re reaction reflects this. Okay? To balance an equation, you can add numbers in front of chemical formulas. These numbers are called coefficients. So when you're balancing, you will use things that are called coefficients, and they're numbers that are in front of your formula. And they are used to represent how many of that atom um, is, is in participating in the reaction. You cannot balance equations by changing the formula of anything there. Formulas are very specific to the compounds, to the crystal lattices, to the structural diagrams of molecules. You can't change those. They are simply the compounds that are reacting you can only change coefficients. Okay. So we'll demo that and we'll give you lots of practice. Okay. All right, so steps for balancing. Now you don't always have to follow these steps. This is just something that you, to get us into going here and so on, okay? So write the, uh, let's, I'm gonna remove that and just say chemical equation. So write the chemical equation, which really means write an equation with formula. That was our second type of equation we looked at. Now, to balance the atoms, you're going to look generally in the largest number of atoms on either side. And you want to leave um, things out like hydrogen, oxygen, and elements until later. Okay. Um, another thing that I'd mention here is don't break up polyatomics unless they break up. Okay. So if you can see a polyatomic on both sides, leave it the way that it is and just use that as a unit and balance the unit and not necessarily each of the individual atoms. And we'll give you an example of that in a minute, okay? Balance hydrogens and oxygens after that. Balance anything that is uncombined, I suppose, and then check your answer, okay? So let's just put this to the test, okay? Let's just start with the example at the bottom and then we'll do a couple other ones, okay? So copper two nitrate reacts, so let's write this down as an equation first, okay? So copper two nitrate, so copper two nitrate, Okay. reacts with potassium hydroxide. Ooh, I went the wrong way. I went the wrong way. Potassium hydroxide. H. All right. Uh, to form uh, potassium nitrate. and then uh, copper hydroxide, copper hydroxide, there you go. Okay. Now we're also gonna throw in some states on this that is given to us in the equation and then we'll use our brains to kind of figure out the rest after that. Okay, what's a state that I know for sure? So we're going to write down solid over there. Okay. Now, these are two ionic substances, and they're two solids that if I put them together, they don't do anything. So to react these, I'm going to need them dissolved in water. So if it's dissolved in water, what symbol am I going to use for this? AQ. So AQ. And same thing for this one, AQ. 
and Q. Now this one states over here that solid is produced, but the rest would just stay in the solution. So we will leave this one as AQ. All right, now the coefficients go into these positions if we're gonna use them. Okay, so in front of the formula, that's where my coefficients can go. Okay. So now there's a couple of things you can do and we're gonna look at the, you can, let's do something that might be very basic. You just basically look on each side and you look at the different groups that are there. So there's copper on this side. And then we're gonna say, how many coppers are on this side? And this goes into your counting atoms that you did last year as well. There's only one. Okay. All right, now we're gonna leave this one as a polyatomic by itself because it also appears over here. So we're just gonna use NO3s. And how many NO3s are on this side? Uh, just on the left side. Two. All right. So then we're going to go over to Ks. How many Ks are on just on the left side as it stands now? There's only one. Okay. And it looks like the OH is over here as well. So we treat the OH as a group by itself. Then how many OHs are on this side over here? How many OHs on this side? Just one. Okay. So then we can compare it to this side over here. So there were CUs, NO3s, Ks, and OHs. So there's no new elements here, right? They're all the same elements that we had before, or at least polyatomic uh, groups that we had before. So now we're going to decide if they're the same. So how many coppers are over on this side? This looks like one. How many NO3s are over on this side? One. How many Ks are over on this side? On the right side now. How many uh, Ks? One. And how many OHs? Two. Two. All right. Are my numbers the same for each of the groups? No. Okay. So then we do have to do some balancing at this point. Now, the only things that we can change are the numbers in front. The formula cannot be changed. So only these amounts. And what these numbers are gonna really give us is a proportion of each of these things that react and what proportion of products are created. Okay. So if I wanted to start balancing this, I would just do something. So right now we have one of everything. One, 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 one. It's there. It's a one. Okay. What I could do is I could do something like, I don't know, let's put a two here. So now it's going to be one of these and two of those. And what do they make over here? Okay. Now, if I change this to a two, what does it change on our side over here? How many Ks do I have on this side? Two. So this changes to a two. How many OHs do I have on this side? It changes to a two. So this change here affects these two things down here. It doubles them. Okay. Am I balanced? No, but at least that's closer, although I did make a difference here now. Okay. Now there is a one other step I can do here. This just comes from practice. I don't need to change anything else over here. I can actually balance.